sheet. That's when you have sheet rice. So I don't know. Just have you know. Just decided. I'm the Associate Director of the Holocaust and Human Rights Center of Maine, which is located in this beautiful building on the campus of uh, the University of Maine at Augusta. It's called the Michael Clarr Center. Michael was a uh, hidden child in the Holocaust who was uh, hidden in, in a uh, farmhouse in southern France uh, from the ages of three till six. Um, and he was he lived in a rabbit hutch um, and both of his parents were murdered and then Michael was uh, raised his his uh, his uncle by that point by the end of the war had made it to New York and they lived um, in uh, Brooklyn and uh, and Michael was uh, brought over by his uncle and lived with his family. Uh, grew up, joined the Marines, became a successful uh, real estate broker in New York, and then met and fell in love with a woman from Fort Kent, Maine. <laughs> Typical story, I know. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, Michael is remembered from this beautiful uh, center. He passed away in uh, 1998. Um, but his uh, widow still uh, is uh, around and is on our board, lives in Falmouth, is a lovely person. Um, it's so a, it is indeed a beautiful it's a beautiful building. So in addition to educational programs that we do, a lot of, lot of educational outreach work, uh, we go to schools and also welcome schools to our facility. Um, and present different kinds of programs about the Holocaust, uh, the Holocaust and the, the roots of the Holocaust, and also a lot of human rights stories, civil rights work. Um, and uh, we also do exhibits. And so when I was here with the, with the German POWs program, that actually came out of doing an exhibit about the German POWs. Well, as we were getting towards the, uh, the, bicenten or the centennial of, of World War I, um, we were trying to figure out what what we could do about World War One, and um, and the thought I had was that that the hu the human story obviously is the one that I'm also a theater I'm also a theater person and a, and and am an adjunct professor of drama at the University of Maine at Augusta, um, and so I'm always interested in the stories and and one area that that we hadn't looked at was this idea of people writing letters home because we we know about letters some letters in the civil war and some civil war letters exist but more letters came out of world war 1 than many more from world war 2 of course um and so uh, just sort of on a whim i started thinking about whether or not there would be letters and ended up starting with archives uh, at the universities, which are the most accessible archives that exist, plus, plus at the, the um, Maine State Archives, and ended up finding a lot of different letters. And of course, you find them, and then you, and then you have to transcribe them and you know, read them all and transcribe them and, and really see what stories come out. So it was one of those programs where I really didn't know what it was going to look like. But it turned out to look a, like a pretty interesting uh, story. So uh, the program uh, was was created, of course, or the or the this idea was created, of course. But then then when you're talking about creating an exhibit, you have to figure out ways to visually represent this idea of letters. And so I did have a table. With all with scans of all the letters, in hard copies, where you could actually sit down and read letters, and think about them and go through them, but wanted to figure out other ways to have a visual representation. 
And one thing that's a challenge in World War I is, is, is that the photographs are generally not terrific because it took so long for somebody to pose for a photograph back then. And, and um, there are photographs around, obviously. But what I learned in this process is a little bit more about reenactors. And there are, of course, you, you probably have heard of Civil War reenactors. That's a really big thing. If you go to Gettysburg, there are a lot of stores that just specialize in this items for reenactors. Well, it turns out there are reenactors for everything. And right around World War I, of course, the World War I reenactors uh, were doing lots of visual, vi visible stuff. And so I, I looked around a little bit. I ended up finding a, a guy who is a, um, a professor, I think, at UMass Amherst, um, who, uh, who had taken these photos in Connecticut at a World War I reenactment event that were terrific. And so we had several of these photographs from John Wentland, and um, this is an example of one. And the reason that this is valuable is because there are very few photographs where we actually get to look into somebody's eyes who is the same age as these individuals that we're talking about. And this guy just looks like a doughboy. <laughs> And so it was a great way to sort of enter into this concept. This is a little bit what regular World War I photographs look like. So then I took letters and text of letters and found different ways to visualize and, and present visually the stories that were told. So, for example, I paired this photograph with a letter from somebody named Kenneth Wilson, who was, uh, quote, somewhere in France. Many of the letters say somewhere in France um, because they weren't allowed to say where they were from. And there actually were uh, uh, censors within each regiment who is the one who had to make sure everybody was... Uh, was not giving things away. However, during the course of this project, it wasn't, I didn't find these letters, but I read about a guy who found letters from the censor. And the reality is nobody censored the censors. <laughs> and so the censors' letters were really descriptive and great. But this is from somebody named Kenneth Wilson, somebody in France dated December 25th, 1917. And he wrote, We celebrated Christmas today and you could hardly think that only a bunch of fellows could get so much spirit out of the occasion. We had our Christmas decorations and the supply of holly and mistletoe was not restricted because they both grew here in abundance. <laughs> December 25th, 1917. This is a letter from somebody who was serving in the war from Maine prior to the United States entrance into the war. That's another thing that we uncovered in this process. We only consider World War I to be 1918 and 1919. But if you talk to anybody in Germany, in France, in Belgium, in Canada, in England, Australia, they're all going to talk about 1916 to 1919. One such person was Murray Alexander Morgan, who's right here in a family portrait. He was probably 21 years old when he first enrolled in Colby College. He had been born in Heartland, New Brunswick in 1889, and his parents, Solomon and Minnie Morgan, moved the family to Millinocket, Maine around 1900. Murray was one of seven or eight children, 
He was educated in the Millinocket schools and worked in the paper mill to make enough money to attend school. It was not uncommon back then, of course, for young men and women to try to save enough money for a, to go to a semester of school and then go back and work and pay for another semester. My grandparents went to college in that way. And then uh, he would continue to do that in order to get through school. Well, that's what Mary Murray Morgan did. He went back and forth a couple of times. And by the fall of 1914, he was an active senior at Colby College in Waterville. He was a member of the Delta Epsilon fraternity. He was in the philosophy club, the Epicureans. And as a trombone player, he had, quote, more than ordinary ability. <laughs> And he was a member of the band. By all accounts, Murray Morgan was a normal college student. But like all Americans, he was aware of the war in Europe, even though America hadn't joined the war. Uh, and he, uh, it, but he also was paying attention to the war, not just from America's point of view, but from Canada's point of view, because, of course, that's where his relatives well, the entrance of the Canadian forces in the war seemed to have prompted Murray Morgan to act. Um, and uh, when Canadian infantrymen first hit the Western Front in January of 1915, he was aware of that. And in March, the 1st Canadian Division took part in uh, something called the Battle of Neve Chapelle. And Morgan dropped out of school just after Easter in April of 1915, and he went to Canada and enlisted, where he joined the famed Princess Patricia's Light Infantry, or the Princess Pats, as they were called. While at Colby College, Morgan had befriended a popular professor named Harold Leon Pepper, or Cap, as everybody knew him. Following his death in June of 1949, it was reported that Cap Pepper had written as many as 2,500 letters to his, quote, kids serving in World War I and nearly 5,000 letters to his kids serving in World War II. Murray Morgan was one of Cap's kids, and Murray Morgan wrote back often. His first letter is from the Shorncliffe Training Grounds on the English Channel, dated July 17, 1915. He wrote, We'll now drop you a line from Merry England and from a place within sound of guns in France, about 40 or 50 miles away. We arrived here a week ago today, having arrived at Plymouth on Friday the 9th. There are about 10,000 Canadians here, and they keep coming and going all the time. All the boys in camp are anxious to cross the channel and go at it, as, and they will soon have the chance. A little over a month later, he wrote, Dear friend Cap, just a line tonight before we sail to France tomorrow. Give my friends my best regards and tell my enemies to go to hell. <laughs> and then he added a little dangling line and idea, expect to see you and the U.S. Army Christmas. So here again, this was the beginning of, uh, of, of the efforts to get the United States in. This is, of course, in, in uh, 1915, so it didn't happen. By September, he was somewhere in France. We'll drop you a line now from the front, which I have traveled several thousand miles to see. Have been in trenches, which in places are only 45 yards from the Germans. We give them a lively time of it and throw chestnuts at them, which they don't like. <laughs> Casualties are very few so far, but one can't tell what may happen in the near future. The last that Pepper heard from him was a postcard March 2nd, 1916. It's a little souvenir, uh, he wrote. This is a souvenir from some entanglements the battalion has been in. Best luck and good wishes to all friends. Murray Morgan was killed sometime between June, 4th, June 2nd and June 4th uh, at the Battle of Dead Man's Hill near Verdun. Murray Alexander was one of the first Mainers killed in World War I. But he wasn't fighting for the United States. 
So according to history, he's not among the first Mainers killed in World War I. In fact, he's not listed as being killed in World War I anywhere in the United States because he wasn't a Mainer officially, I guess, even though he lived here and spent all his life here and went to college here. The first Mainer killed in the United States was another Maine college student, Harold Andrews, a native of Portland. He was a student of Orono when he was enlisted when, uh, when Earl Shuttleworth was here. I suspect that he mentioned uh, Harold Andrews. Um, Andrews, was a member, Andrews was a member of the 11th Engineers. And the engineers built, operated, and maintained standard and narrow gauge railway lines that delivered the troops and supplies to the front. So as the, as the battle moved forward, he was with this group of guys that would build railroad tracks or add on to the little narrow gauge railroad tracks that would continue to supply the front. In November of 1917, a battle plan had been created to make big gains on German lines, but using some 500 tanks to clear away the center of the German line. The 11th and 12th engineers would follow quickly and build these railroad lines to deliver additional, additional troops and supplies to keep tanks moving. In a short time, the Allies cut a hole that was 20 miles wide and pushed six miles into the German line. It was the German line was the famous Hindenburg line. Paul von Hindenburg was a great German general. Uh, he would go on later to become the president of Germany. And actually, it's a negotiated agreement with President Paul von Hindenburg that named Adolf Hitler Chancellor of Germany. And then when von Hindenburg died a year later, Hitler and the Nazis were able to take complete control of Germany. So von Hindenburg is a historically very interesting character. He was old when that took place. Yeah, he died of natural, probably died of natural causes, right. But he may not have been with it at the time when he played the role. Right. And I, sus I suspect if you look, not to get too far off track, but I suspect that if you really looked at the situation, Paul von Hindenburg made what he thought at the moment was the best choice for a compromise. Not unlike the agreement that the British signed with, with Nazi Germany um, that, that there wouldn't be any aggression. They didn't really have a whole lot of other choices um, in the moment. So we all might have made that same decision. Who knows? So on this date, when the, when the Allies broke through this Hindenburg line, they had made this great progress of about six miles. Uh, for about 20 miles wide. They thought they were going to go forward. However, just like in any other battle plan, if you're not moving the whole line forward, if you just take one part forward, you expose your sides and then you're in deep trouble. Well, that's what happened. <laughs> On the morning of November 30th, Shells started falling on the men of the 11th Regiment who were working near a place called Cambry. The Germans were counterattacking and retaking their lost territory from the sides and then from the front. The 11th Infantry, which was the group that Harold Andrews was a member of, um, had been told that Things were going so well that day, it was not necessary for them to bring their rifles. They should just bring their tools. Wow. And when the counterattack happened, of course, they were left without anything. So the story goes, they fought with their picks and shovels. Many of them managed to work their way back to the British lines. Andrews apparently found an abandoned machine gun nest and started firing. Harold Andrews was among the six men who were killed in action by the, from the 11th Regiment uh, that day. Another 13 men were wounded and 11 men were captured by the Germans. 
one of the letters that we found was a very simple one. Um, and it was from Harold Andrews's mother to the president of the University of Maine. My son succeeded in gaining the English line, but not content to remain a mechanic while the English were sorely pressed. He seized a rifle and fell into line by the side of his comrades and was probably instantly <laughs> killed. Such is the summary of the short career of my soldier boy. That's the information we have. When you go to the, what I think is the adjutant general's report of the events that day, this story doesn't quite square with that story. <laughs> and one of the things that's maddening about history, especially history like this, is that we never really can know actually what happened, except for that we know Harold Andrews died on that particular day. And it was a German counteroffensive that caught them without any resources. So what's interesting about history, and you know, you were talking about recording people's stories. And what's really interesting and important about recording stories is that you get the first-hand account in those recordings. It might not be entirely the truth <laughs> because we all don't always tell the truth, but we tell the story that we tell and then it gets recorded. And we've seen this over and over and over again. And because I'm talking to uh, the originals, um, I, I think that it's really important for you to consider as, as, as you're thinking about this, how does your story get told? It's ironically one of the, one of the interesting history things that, that has come up through this musical Hamilton that's the biggest show around the country, around the world right now, um, on broad, from Broadway. And it's, a, it's the history of Alexander Hamilton. You might have, you might have heard about it, um, but it's in rap and hip hop and uh, the people of color are in all different aspects of, of, uh, of the story. But one of the lines is there is, is who lives, who dies, who tells your story. And in World War I and other wars, we have so many, and the Holocaust, we have so many issues of who lives, who dies, who tells the story. So I'll just tell you a quick story about Michael Klar, who our center is named after. Michael, of course, left France when he was seven years old and went to New York, lived his life, obviously learned to speak English and you know, uh, uh, mostly lost all of his French. When Michael was in his 30s or 40s, maybe even, he went back to this house where he had been hidden as a child and knocked on the door. The house was in, in way southern France. It turns out that the house had been owned by Italians and it was an Italian family that he lived with. And they had a young girl. And there were times where they knew that the Nazis wouldn't be coming and that they allowed Michael to come into the house and he and the little girl could play together. But for the most part, he was hidden in this rabbit hutch because the Nazis came through at any time. That was part of the insidiousness of the way they did things is that you never could feel comfortable. Um, so Michael knocked on this door and a woman answered and he tried sort of in this pigeon French to figure out who, if, if this person, he, if he knew this person. And they somehow led him to an apartment in the back of the house. And he knocked on the door in the back of the house and he says, Je suis Michel, I am Michael. And the woman's face lit up 
She was about the same age as Michael. She hugged him. She brought him in. She told him every bit of information about his past living at the house. She was the little girl who had played with him. The problem was it was just Michael and her. She didn't speak English and he didn't speak French. <laughs> and she was so excited to tell this story. And then uh, they ended their meeting with, with Michael taking down cryptic notes and trying to figure out what she had said. And he said he would, he would come back at some point. Um, and then went back to the States and came back several years later, went back to the house with somebody, had somebody who could speak French. And they found out that the young woman, that the woman had moved and they didn't know where she was. And he didn't know his, her name. And he never found out <laughs> the real story. <laughs> I just heard that story uh, from uh, Phyllis Chabert a few, a few months ago. Um, and it's like oh, so heartbreaking. But that's actually part of what this is. We don't know. So going back to Murray Morgan, one of the last letters that Cap received about Murray Morgan was from Murray Morgan's sister who said, you were friends with my brother. I know he wrote you back and forth. The family doesn't understand why he went and joined the war. He didn't come home and tell us he was going to. He just wrote and told us that he had and that he was in France. Did he say anything to you to tell us why he did this? There's no letter back. There's no record of a letter back. There's no mention of it from Cap any time later on. We'll never know. That's part of how it works. So let's look at some other excerpts from letters. And, and, and these are from stories people we don't really know um, much about beyond these letters. And I think you could go through and really find their military information, but I'm not sure you can find out much more without really digging into each person. But we find so much in the letters. Paul Keniston, he wrote from the 7th, uh, he was in the 7th Company of the 2nd Battalion. He was from, I think, Dover Foxcroft, Maine. And he wrote about getting on the train. This morning found us at the local board office where we were divided into squadrons of eight men each. The two bands and a host of Dover's population escorted us to the train where a short speech was delivered. By the time the train started to mob, the, a mob was present, wildly uh, cheering wildly. Once on the way, our numbers were increased at Burnham Junction, Newport Junction, Waterville and Brunswick until we left the main central at Deering Junction. So you get this idea of the excitement of marching in. There are great photos uh, from the University of Maine from up in Orono because the entire uh, University of Maine band had enlisted together as a regimental band and when they marched into to the railroad tracks, there was a huge uh, event. Any indication of what the actual size of that group became? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I I would say pro probably it was not a whole mo lot more than a hundred, hundred and fifty, two hundred men probably by that time, because this is just one one trip, you know. So it's whatever they had planned. And you were once you enlisted, then you were, then then you were assigned. They didn't. Hmm? They didn't form a unit or something like that. They didn't. They didn't form a unit. A but to 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 um, answer your question, it was world, sort of answer your question. World War One was actually the cause. The horrors of World War One was the cause of them changing from units where everybody knew each other and everybody came from the same place to units where they had assigned them more randomly uh, 
from all over the place. Because if a unit got wiped out and that unit was from, you know, South Paris, that community got devastated. And so, and that happened in, in we know that from the Civil War, we know that from uh, World War I, and then they stopped that practice. That's actually a very good chain for feelings of support. Absolutely, absolutely. That they needed to, to be able to continue to build that support and interest. Because entering into World War I was very controversial all the way through, of course. But it was also the, the beginning of the America is the strongest, greatest country in the world concept as well. So the Brits and the French and the Canadians and the Australians all have a bit of a different view of what, of what America military power was in, in World War I. Because from their point of view, we did all the terrible stuff and got everybody killed. And then in the last minute, the U.S. walked in and was like, we're great, we did it, we helped, you know. And so that's sort of the attitude that, that, but that's not what we have. Unfortunately, the other part of that is we don't really know the history of World War I. We don't really think about World War I. We just Probably. celebrate it. Hmm? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, what are those? He was in the Navy towards the end of the war. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was he he really believed it, he really believed and that was part of the that was part of the that's part of what you had to believe. Right. Even though his major uh, reputation for the war was being identified by his bare rear, rear end when you leaned over <laughs> a, a, a wall over a little road to Paris, oh. <laughs> <laughs> the commanding officer in Hudson County. Oh, <laughs> well, there you go. So here's a sample menu from a day in camp that was in one of the letters. Breakfast, rolled oats, scrambled eggs, fried potatoes, be bread and butter, and cocoa. Dinner, liver and onions, mashed potatoes, peaches, applesauce, bread and butter, coffee. Supper, corn stew, stewed prunes, bread and butter, cocoa. It's not too bad for a soldier's fare, is it? It was Lewis White in Green, Camp Green and down in Charlotte. Now, oh. Uh, one thing that's interesting that we don't even think about, you probably don't even think about, but students have no idea what this concept of dinner versus supper is. <laughs> it's a, wait a minute, what is that? You know, but it was, of course, the way that they did it then. Uh, when you look at, leather, at letters, I, my point of view about the World War I is that the YMCA missed a tremendous opportunity during the celebration of the centennial of World War I because the YMCA and the YWCA were the most important United States organizations to the soldiers in the fields. The way we think of the USO in World War II and beyond is what the YMCA did in World War I. Fully 50% of the letters that we found are written on YMCA stationery that was given out to soldiers. Perhaps the most impressive part of camp life is the work of the YMCA. Several evenings I have stood outside the big YMCA auditorium filled with several thousand soldiers and seen several thousand more turned away, disappointed, and cross. Private Ralph DeWolf, and that's at Camp Upton, New York, in June of 1918. There's a, I have a beautiful series of letters from a, a woman named Lila Ferris who took a train from Maine, from Boston, all the way down to uh, Georgia and wrote wonderful letters along the way um, that have survived. I was soon, I soon was opposite the Capitol. I stood gazing for a while, but it was hot and sultry and I draggedly wended my way to the station, to the soda fountain, where I stayed so long drinking lemonade and ice water that I almost missed my train. 
if you've ever been to D.C. And you, and you know Union Station, you know that walk to the Capitol. And to imagine this young lady doing that in the, and you also know the heat of, of summer in D.C., and to imagine that in May of, of 1918. Dragon, <laughs> isn't that great? Here's uh, an amazing group of letters from a guy named Martin Phelan, who is from central Maine somewhere, and there were a whole series of these letters. My disposition and character prevents me from injuring or killing anyone. If I am placed in the trenches, I can never aim a gun at a man or an, in a body of men and pull a trigger, for it makes me shudder to think of it. Furthermore, to lacerate a man with a bayonet, I cannot do. This is all against my nature, and living with my mother for so long and leading a Christian life, I was never taught to injure or insult anyone. And thus, retaining the same Christian attitude, I believe that my presence among these soldiers is only a menace to them. They are all sturdy men and full of the fighting spirit, which I cannot develop. This letter came from Newport News, Virginia, where he was at Camp Stewart. There's also a letter from him in France that says essentially the same thing, only with a little more desperation. We don't know what happened to him. Why was he in? That's he. He had been. He had been chosen. Wow. You know, by them. Wow. This is nineteen, late nineteen eighteen or mid nineteen eighteen. I did active duty on the USS San Diego until she was sh shrunk, sunk either by enemy mine or torpedo fifty miles out from New York on July nineteenth, nineteen eighteen. William Cooper. William Cooper amazingly was on two different ships that sunk while he was they on them and then and then eventually made his way to be working at the um uh at the docks in brooklyn <laughs> but he he was uh, wrote about one of the ships the father was scheduled to, to report that ship three days after it sunk. oh my god that's amazing wow. his connections are made all the time There are many phases to this life which I thoroughly enjoy, and this enjoyment is sufficient to carry me through the hard and disagreeable work. For instance, bayonet killing is a very brutal exercise, and the instructor has told us no one who is good-looking or not willing to make himself a brute is worth two cents when he is facing a hun. That from Carl Belmore. I think he was a student at, uh, at um, Bates. Um, that's the camp from Plattsburgh, New York. News reached us yesterday that the transport which brought us over a year ago was torpedoed off the Irish coast. A whole convoy of submarines attacked her. She fought them off for 26 hours but finally succumbed to the torpedo. This news affected us like the death of an old friend. Waylon Towner, he was from Dover Foxcroft, Maine. He wrote many, many letters. Actually, one of the interesting qualities about Wayland Towner's letters is they were so completely conversational to his to his family. He was like, "You said the other day, blah 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 blah." It was was it was really remarkable. Then there were also there were also several letters as the universities started to put together their histories of students in World War One. They asked for letters from family members for those who were who were killed from family members or or regimental leaders, um, and this actually came from uh, one of his superior officers or one of his fellow uh, soldiers. Captain Keep and his four lieutenants spent the night together in a shallow depression, which was hastily dug for protection from shell fragments. It is not unusual for officers to remain in groups while under fire, but in the situation it was considered necessary to have a running guard with one officer awake and on alert at all times, and they kept together to avoid a very rare da real danger incident to walking along lines under the conditions for the purpose of relieving each other. Just before dawn, a shell hit squarely in the little trench. Henry Keep, 
was the runner. He was the guy who said, yeah, I'll come with you guys and sit in there. And just by chance was with that group that was killed in a direct hit. And no conversation about World War I uh, can be had without talking about the flu. Uh, the flu was, was, the, was the biggest killer of World War I. This in the account of the death of a student, Frances Ellen Bartlett. She sailed for France as an RC nurse on the 31st of July, following the same occupation at a war hospital in France until seized with influenza, followed by pneumonia, of which she died on October 17th, 1918. So, not even six months later, after she got there. And, and the, the cost of the flu was, was tremendous. And, and there's, a lot, there, there's a lot who say, the historians say, if not for World War I, the, there would have been no epidemic or pandemic of the flu in the world but it's because so many people were moving in so many places and and the conditions of course were terrible yeah 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 from world war one yeah. from the soldiers yeah in my last letter I wrote of the life in the of life in the trenches while waiting for the Hun to pay a visit. Now I could paint a far different picture, but that but, but there would be too much horror in it. I try to put things such things out of my mind, and I never wish to remember things I have seen in the last month. To describe the destruction of men and equipment would be a task wor uh, worthy of a better man than I. This is from Kilburn Sherman who grew up in Booth Bay. Uh, Kilburn Sherman was, uh, had a remarkable life. He, he went over, wrote a lot of letters. He was gassed, uh, I think maybe a month after this or so. He was gassed, um, but then saved a whole bunch of French soldiers by carrying them after this gassing, he carried them back and then went and got more. And on that same day, he was captured by the French or by the Germans, and he was then taken back um, and was held in captivity for about three months. They did a lot of prisoner exchanges um, back then. Uh, and we even have a letter that he wrote to his father uh, from prison camp. And the letter basically says, Dad, I'm doing great. I'm in prison camp here in Germany. I'm, I'm doing just fine in better health than I was before getting here. Hope to see you soon, essentially. In the report of the day that he was captured that was written by the commanding officers and the researchers when he was nominated to win the Corps de Guerre, which is the highest honor uh, the French give. It's like the French Medal of Honor. Uh, they wrote about that day. And he was gassed and carried men, helped men get back and forth. And by the time he was captured, he could barely walk. And he was, uh, he, he almost died a couple of times through the process of being a POW and was finally released because he was so sick and they didn't want him to die as a POW. And, and then he was nursed back to health and uh, he was awarded the Corps de Guerre uh, and he um, uh, was also. Uh, then came back and was a very proud veteran, ended up being a sharpshooter with the um, L.A. County Police uh, or Sheriff's Department um, uh, and lived in Los Angeles his whole life. The reason we know so much about him is because his uh, nephew, Barry Sherman, still lives in uh, 
um, in uh, Booth Bay. And Barry is a, a hero himself. He's a veteran of uh, Vietnam. And if you watch the Ken Burns uh, Vietnam uh, program, uh, when they, the, the, one of the things that was, there were a lot of things remarkable in that, but one of the things was remarkable was those guys driving around in the, in the armored vehicles, and then there's a guy on top of the armored vehicle with a machine gun, but there's nothing ar around them to protect them. And, and I remember very distinctly one of them going through a, through a ditch or something like that, and the guy's like bouncing around up on top of this vehicle. That was what Barry Sherman did <laughs> in Vietnam. And uh, he had many, many, many friends who were killed in Vietnam um, and uh, is a remarkable individual. But the pride he has about Kilburn and his father um, and uh, another, a younger, younger, his father was, uh, Kilburn was quite a bit older, his father and, a, and a, uh, another brother who were in uh, at Iwo Jima. Um, and so there's this whole family of these Marines. Kilburn was the first of them. Finally, we're realizing here, as we never did before, what it means to live in the good old United States. I mean in regard to liberties and luxuries. I used to call them either conveniences or necessities. For instance, I know you would smile to see three or four of us shaving, our mirrors hung perhaps on a branch of a tree or a towel over our shoulders and a towel over our shoulders or, e or eating, our mess kits spread on granite stairs and scattered about the ground. That was Paul Kennison wrote it from France. How do you spell Kennison? K -E, he spells it K-E-N-N-I-S-O-N. K-E-N-N-I-S-O-N -E 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 is how he spells it. Because I'm part of Keniston. You're Keniston's with a T? K-E-N-I-S-T-O-N. -E oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, a, there's several of them. You probably have to think at some point they're connected, right? But maybe yeah, not. I don't know. Where he comes from and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So more than 65 million men from 30 countries fought in World War I. Nearly 10 men and women, men, nearly 10 million died. An additional 5 million civilians were killed. And in the war, over 20 million soldiers and civilians were injured. And of course, the Spanish flu caused nearly a third of all military deaths. Now, World War I transformed the United States into the largest military power in the world. For many participants, it was an opportunity to scan, stand up against our enemies, which was very exciting. And then at the end of World War I, the entire world, practically, got together and said, you know, this idea of a world war is so terrible we should never do it again. That was in 1920. And so then, of course, they never did it again. There was never another war. Eh, wait a second. If not for the end of World War I, however, it's hard to make the case that the Holocaust would have happened. Because at the end of World War I, Germany was completely crushed and just left alone. And that situation created an opportunity for this group of people to say, hey, we can actually work to make Germany a powerhouse again, to make Germany be strong and survive. And because nobody else was lending a hand, nobody else was paying attention, it worked. People started to listen to them because they didn't have any other alternative. So if 
if you ever hear people talk about, well, why did we do the Marshall Plan? Why was the, you know, why did we rebuild Europe? Why did we help rebuild Europe after World War II? Well, it's specifically because the end of World War I and what happened. And so there's a lot, there's a lot to be learned from this war that we all sort of conveniently forget. <laughs> it's not really about winning or losing. Everybody pretty much lost. Um, and it only got worse then after that. So just to leave you with the idea that, um, that we need to understand how important our place is in history, I'll leave you with, a, with, with something that a Bates student, a guy named Pearly W. Lane, wrote. Um, because we think about today being these tremendously challenging times and what's happening to our country. But in fact, we're in a time where more and more people are realizing that democracy is a participation sport. Somebody else isn't going to do it for us. And if we sit back and let somebody else do it for us, we're probably going to get in some trouble. And so I agree with Pearlie Lane, who wrote, what an opportunity it is to live in such an age. He was talking about World War I, but I think it's appropriate for now as well. We have a great opportunity to rethink what we mean by democracy, what we mean by civil rights, what we mean by human rights, what we mean by the Bill of Rights. And, and I think as we begin a new year, hopefully we begin a new attitude because standing and facing each other and screaming at each other isn't really working that well. <laughs> so thank you very much. Have a great New Year. Of course, you can ask me more.